Thank you, Will, for such a flattering introduction. Um, please seat and make yourself comfortable. <sighs> all right. So um, we all know here what, what caddying is, right? You, uh, you, know, you go lug someone's bag around golf course, and they pay you at the end. Yes, this is the only interactive part of the speech, so feel free to take advantage of it. <laughs> all right. Well, I'm just going to assume we do. So anyway, that's been my summer job for pretty much my whole life. And uh, the best thing, really, that it's taught me is that I absolutely hate it. Um, everything about the job is awful. You get up at 5.45 to wait in a cold and dark room on the hope that maybe, possibly, if the planets align correctly, your name will be called and you'll get a loop. Of course, there's absolutely no guarantee that you'll get a loop, which is just a fancy name for catting 18 holes. And when you don't, you got up early just to go be idle somewhere a lot colder when you could be perfectly idle in bed. But if it does happen, if you do get a loop, you go out to the pro shop, meet the person whose 40-pound bag you're going to be carrying around for the next five hours, and then boom, like a lanky gazelle being chased by a ravenous cheetah, you are sprinting down the first fairway, hoping that you can magically spot a sphere one inch in diameter flying at 150 miles an hour against a sky that, when cloudy, is quite literally the exact same color. Then, after five hours of toil, your feet kill, your arms feel like they're going to fall off, your sun burn beyond belief, and you end up, quite literally, on the exact same point you started, no displacement. The bright side, though, is you're about $100 richer on a good day. So my loathing and dread for caddying began at the tender age of 14. I still remember, to this day, the sound of my dad's car driving off as I was left, as I was left cold, alone, and in awe of the prestige of Marion Golf Club's East Course. The day was May 5th, 2007. My birthday is May 4th. For on the day I turned 14, my dad gave me not an iPod, nor a bike, nor a sweater, but working papers. Um, I still remember what he said to me when he handed me that fateful 4 by inch, 4 by 8 inch piece of paper. He said, son, work is a gift, and if you could go off to college and have learned only one thing from me, I'd like you to be self-reliant. See, the ability to work hard put me where I am today, because I've never been the smartest guy around, but I've always been able to outwork everyone else. If you can do both, well, then you can do anything. To which I replied, oh, you've got to be kidding me. And I probably ruined a possibly heartfelt moment of maturity and understanding, but sure enough, there I stood the next day at Marion Golf Club to learn to work hard. So I caddied in the spring and the summer, and, the, uh, and in all subs uh, excuse me, I caddied in the spring and into the summer that year, and in all subsequent years of my life, but my parents actually started working on that hardworking and smart thing much earlier when I applied to private school. Uh, my parents decided that I should apply to private school kind of late. They weren't too fond of the public middle school, and I wasn't really feeling it there either. So on the July after my sixth grade year, they decided to send in some applications to Shipley, NDA, hoping that I'd be accepted for eighth grade, and they'd have plenty of time to weigh the decision, and I'd have plenty of time to weigh the decision. Fate would not have it so. Um, on the last day of summer, before I would return to Radnor Middle School for seventh grade, I came home from a bike trip to Wawa. Uh, my mom immediately accosted me and dragged me into our guest bedroom. While I racked my brain for what rules I had so egregiously broken to merit an immediate family meeting of such magnitude and severity, I listened to a message on her phone saying basically, Hi, Mr. and Mrs. Henson. We would just like to inform you that a spot has opened up and we'd like your son to attend the Episcopal Academy. School starts in two days. Bye. And um, so we went out for a celebratory dinner. My family was telling me how lucky I was and how excited they were and how happy I should be. Um, but when they finally got around to asking me if I wanted to come to school here, I answered with a pretty, pretty point-blank no. Uh, I did not want to leave the people I knew or the familiarity of where I spent the last year. I didn't want to deal with an hour bus ride each way, but of course it wasn't up to me. And as sure as my physics teachers will never prove of Arts Week, the next day my mom and I went out and bought a shirt and tie, and then the day after that I was dropped off at EA. Initially, I'll be honest, I didn't enjoy coming here as much as I didn't enjoy caddying. In, in fact, probably more. Um, I dreaded waking up in the morning an hour earlier than all my friends from Radnor to go spend that hour on the bus to get to a place where I had to wear uncomfortable clothes and I didn't know anyone. It was terrible. Plus, then, a few months into school, I had to get my appendix out. And, uh, yeah, that wasn't fun either. So those first, those first few months were just all in all a bad experience. And maybe it was because of the turmoil that now surrounded my education, but I wasn't really getting great grades either, which was, of course, the, of course, the point that I came to this school, to excel and thrive. But, you know, just wasn't happening. And it continued not to happen, mostly because I wasn't trying hard. I pretty much put in the bare minimum of effort into school from seventh grade through freshman year. I remember getting my ninth grade interim comments in the first semester and having my dad freak out at me because I had an F in Latin. I just didn't put in any work. Uh, so those of you who know me probably find this a little interesting or at least kind of out of character because for the past two years I've been roughly as hardworking as could possibly be. 
Some people know me, as Will mentioned, as a Scolium editor, a Politan editor, a Seal editor, or Mock Trial and Junto, or for Open Mic and Arts Week, or some Domino Productions, or because I could probably still write an essay on how Bacon's Rebellion impacted the pre-revolutionary era, even though I haven't learned that stuff in a year. Um, I don't think I'd even eat lunch if I didn't have Z-Block free, because I have a club meeting every day, but I'm not really here to tell you how overcommitted I am, just what changed. Because I used to be a proudly mediocre slacker who absolutely hated it here, and now I'm a proud workaholic who kind of loves it here. So I guess in short, uh, two things happened. The first one was uh, Medley Music went out of business in Ardmore. Um, so come sophomore year, even though I wasn't trying in school, I had found one thing that I loved, which was music. So when Medley Music had a going out of business sale, I went to see what kind of deals I could find, and then across the room, I saw it. It was a guitar that I'd wanted for a year. It was black with red paisley flames, and I absolutely had to have it. Sadly, even with the going out of business stale, it was still about $1,000, which was money I just did not have, because when I went to buy a new guitar a few months earlier, I was unable to find the Paisley one in a store, and I was told that it would take about a year to order it, so I settled on another great guitar and spent all my summer savings on it. So I begged and pleaded to my father, who hated loaning money to me, especially in such large amounts, but he decided to be merciful. So for Christmas that year, he gave me a 10% interest loan on the, uh, on the guitar. <laughs> Then the next day my amp blew out, and, uh, we went to Med and so I needed a new amp. We went to Medley Music, picked out an amp that happened to be another thousand dollars. In retrospect, probably an immature and ill-informed buying decision, but I was headstrong and my dad fronted the money. I signed another contract for another 10% interest loan, and just like that, $2,200 of debt to my father. <laughs> then I broke my phone, I hit my dad's car when I was pulling out of our driveway. A few other unfortunate events later, I was in $3,800 of debt <laughs> to my father. My only source of income was caddying, and it was just January. So I remained mired down in financial difficulties until March, and then I started working. I worked at least one weekend day a week until school ended, and then I worked every day I could, which was Tuesday through Sunday, every week for the entire summer. Uh, after I caddied, I would come home, take the money I made out of my pocket, leave it on my dad's desk, take a piece of paper out of his drawer, write down the date, how much I made, and how much I now owed him. Then, when we went to Stone Harbor and I couldn't caddy as much, I played guitar and sang on the street corner to make money. By the beginning of August, I was officially out of debt. I was finally able to use my guitar, which I previously wasn't able to do until it was paid off. And every time I used it, I had the pleasure of knowing that it was completely and irrevocably mine. I can look back to those cold summer mornings with a kind of melancholy satisfaction because it might have been awful at the time, but now it was in the past, and the reward was awesome. But that was just the first thing that really affected me. Uh, the second thing that changed me from apathetic to assiduous was a book. And I guess most people who know me probably know what book I'm talking about. Um, the Fountainhead by Ayn Rand. Um, so I won't get preachy about it. I'll just tell you what I took from it. Uh, basically, the book chronicles the rise of an architect um, who really has no support except for his own work ethic, skill, and determination. People disregard his work and they actively try and destroy his reputation, but he still manages to surmount all obstacles, defeat all odds, and rise at the end successful and fulfilled what we all want in life, basically. Um, so what really struck me about this book, though, was that the protagonist didn't really let the whims of others affect him at all. It showed me that, first off, no one could tell me that I was anything less than I saw myself, and secondly, that I could accomplish basically whatever I wanted as long as I worked hard, as hard as I could, and pursued my own visions. So I guess the combination of these two experiences gave me success as I fully paid off uh, my debt without any help and showed me that hard work and perseverance most definitely paid off. So with that, I approached my junior year. I decided to pursue my interests and found that here, my interests were encouraged, whereas in The Fountainhead, the protagonist's interests were discouraged. I joined Scolium as an editorials writer, I joined Mock Trial and was fortunate to become a lawyer. I started participating more in Junto. I also joined the musical, entered the Dorkai music competition, and contributed to Hippolytan. I really just tried my hand at everything and found that I absolutely loved it, all of it. And through these activities, I met people who shared similar interests as I did, and I became a lot happier. In fact, I came to love it here. I was working hard, I was succeeding, and it was awesome. Um, so now I guess comes the part where I tell you exactly why I revealed all this to you. So if I had to pick a moral of this story, it'd be to work hard. Not because China is going to eat our lunch, but for yourself. I really hate to admit it, but I'm actually glad that my dad dropped me off at Marion Golf Club that morning and that my parents sent me to school here. They were right. If you're smart and you work hard, you really can do anything. And my mom and dad forced me into situations that taught me how to work hard and gave me the opportunity to be smart. 
Because of caddying, I've developed a pretty solid work ethic, if I do say so myself, and because I go here, I've been given the opportunity necessary to develop useful skills with which I will find success later in life. If you look at every successful person, those are really the two things that have put them where they are. They were given opportunity, and they took advantage of it by working really hard. What makes it great here is that you have the opportunity quite literally at your fingertips. All you have to do is work hard, and you're set up instantly for success. Though this is true for wherever, wherever we'll end up at college too, and because we go here, statistically we will all end up at college. But uh, the amazing thing about, about it here is that you can pursue anything you want to a high level and be ready to do it in college and for the rest of your life. You can take AP Art, AP Physics, AP Economics. You can even take four semesters of architecture. You don't even have to ask. That's in the curriculum guide. I didn't know that. Um, and if something that you want to do at the collegiate level isn't in the curriculum, just call it 21st century learning and someone will create an avenue for you to do it. The point is, you have the opportunity to learn anything here. Everyone is something they love to do, even if it's not a traditional academic subject, and you can find a way to pursue it here such that you'll be prepared to do it in college and for the rest of your life. Um, so just to recap, right now I basically just said, uh, what makes EA great is you can do more or less anything here, provided you work hard. And if you do work hard here and then in college, you can become outstanding at it. Now, in order to become really outstanding though, you need to put in ridiculous amounts of effort. All professional athletes or famous people who excel at something have made it their life's work to get that good. I mean, I'm talking about effort that would put the McEntee twins to shame, and they give 110% at everything they do. But that's what it takes to become truly outstanding. If you are outstanding, though, you'll achieve levels of personal success in the most rewarding nature possible. Just by working hard and grasping some level of achievement here, I've felt the immense personal satisfaction of a job well done, and I'm definitely not outstanding yet. But there's no doubt in my mind that I can get there, carried merely on the wings of hard work and the benefit of an education here. And when that happens, who knows where I'll be, but wherever it is, I'll have done something profound that I want to do. I'll have success on my own terms, and that's all anyone can ask for. Uh, when I started the speech, I said that the best thing the caddying has taught me is that I hate it. It's true, though, because, because I have the privilege of knowing that I don't want to do some dime a dozen manual labor that anyone can do, I know that I want to be outstanding. Because there's no shortage of doctors, accountants, and lawyers in the world, but there's always a shortage of outstanding doctors, lawyers, and accountants in the world. I want to do something that not everyone can do, and I want to be really good at it. And like my dad said when he handed me those working papers so many years ago, if you work hard, you really can do whatever it is you want. Thank you. <laughs>